Senator Blumenthal. Uh, when you last appeared before this committee in July of 2019, I expressed my concern that Donald Trump's attacks against members of Congress and his other rhetoric, quote, might ignite white supremacists and nationalist organizations and encourage hate crimes, end quote. And I asked you whether you were concerned about the increasing number and intensity of his attacks on public officials and what the FBI was doing both proactively and responsively about them. And you said, quote, I think we are very concerned about any threats of violence against any Americans, but certainly that would prominently include our elected officials. We've seen increasing attacks by the president and others against public officials when the rioters who came to the Capitol, stormed the Citadel of Democracy on January 6th, were inside. They boasted proudly and loudly that they were doing what Donald Trump wanted them to do. We have warned specifically about QAnon in a letter uh, dated December 8th, 2020. A number of us, members of the Senate, warned that QAnon specifically was a threat. Uh, I would like to ask you whether the threat posed by QAnon, and as you well know, adherents of QAnon were among the rioters, very prominently, who stormed the Capitol, whether the continuing threat is worsened when prominent elected officials, including members of Congress, endorse the QAnon theory? Uh, well, certainly we are concerned about the QAnon uh, phenomenon, um, which we view as a um, sort of loose sort of set of conspiracy theories, uh, and we've certainly seen domestic violent extremists uh, of the sort that you're describing um, who uh, cite that as part of their motivation. Uh, so that's something that we, we do. But, but I apologize for yeah. interrupting. As you know, my time is limited. When members of Congress, as has happened, endorse the QAnon theory, doesn't it worsen the threat of violence? Well, again, our, our focus is on the violence um, and on, on the plans to commit violence, on the threats to commit violence. It's less on the rhetoric and the ideology. Uh, obviously, the folks who engage in this kind of violence uh, draw inspiration from a variety of sources, uh, and we're concerned about any source that stimulates or motivates uh, violent extremism. Well, I'll, I'll follow up in another setting, but uh, I am frankly disappointed that you're not discouraging one of the sources of incitement, which is prominent public officials endorsing a theory that in turn resulted in storming the United States Capitol. Let me turn to hate crimes. Uh, hate crimes are underreported. We're seeing a rising trend of hate crimes, particularly directed against Asian American Pacific Islanders. I have a bill called the No Hate Act that would require more reporting, provide both incentives and requirements. Wouldn't you think that kind of measure is a good idea? Uh, so certainly uh, we share your goal of both deterring uh, and reducing hate crime, but also uh, particularly relevantly uh, in promoting better reporting, more complete reporting of hate crime. Uh, and we are specifically concerned uh, about hate crimes against Asian Americans uh, in, uh, as well. Uh, I'm not directly familiar with the bill, but I, I think we share the goal of trying to figure out how to uh, improve reporting. Uh, as you may know, we have, you know, NIBRS, which is a, a new system that we're rolling out, and we're trying to get to 100% uh, on that, and we'd be pleased to work with you on figuring out how, how this bill might, uh, might help advance that goal. Well, the, the No Hate Act would, in fact, lead to better reporting if 87% of hate crimes are 
unreported now. That is a searing indictment of the present system. We need to know more, and particularly about Asian Americans uh, and island Pacificers being victims of them. Uh, I know you don't want to be a, as you said, armchair quarterback, but uh, you're going to be armchair quarterback by the American people. And I think the American people listening to these past 10 days of hearing and knowing how much information there was out there on social media, in other forums about these thugs and rioters coming to Washington, organized groups, three percenters, Proud Boys and others, are wondering why didn't the FBI sound the alarm? I know there was a communication through that threat assessment. I know you've talked about the agencies that were hearing that assessment. But here we have the United States Capitol where a key function of democracy enabling the peaceful transition of power was taking place and a threat of violence and even death to them. Why didn't you go to the Gang of Eight? Why didn't you sound the alarm in some more visible and ringing way? Well, uh, Senator, uh, I guess a couple things. One, uh, over the course of 2020, we repeatedly, repeatedly put out intelligence products uh, on this very issue. Domestic violent extremism, domestic violent extremism specifically tied to the election, domestic violent extremism specifically tied to the election and continuing beyond the election up through the inauguration, and specifically in December of 2020. In addition to that, in connection with the, the one piece of uh, raw intelligence that's been discussed so much here today, we did pass that on to the people in the best position to take action on the threat, uh, not one, not two, but three different ways. Now, more broadly, in terms of what's out in social media, uh, as a number of the questions here today have elicited, uh, I think it highlights, and your question highlights, one of the most challenging uh, jobs for law enforcement in today's world with social media. There is so much chatter often unattributed to somebody in a neatly identifiable way, where people are saying unbelievably horrific, angry, combative things, using language about beheading and shooting and explosives and all kinds of things like that, and separating out which ones are getting traction, which ones reflect intention as opposed to aspiration, is something that we spend an enormous amount of time trying to do. Sometimes we don't have the luxury of time in the ability to make those judgments. I can assure you, that, as I said, I think to Senator Klobuchar, uh, my standard is we're trying to bat a thousand. We want to thwart every attack. And any time there's an attack that's not thwarted, we and our partners want to make sure that we figure out how to do even better at preventing that. We're pleased that the inauguration, for example, went smoothly, notwithstanding threats and chatter that we were seeing, not just here in the national capital region, but against state capitals all across the country. And our focus was on engaging with uh, with all of our partners, our state and local partners. I did a conference call with like a thousand plus police chiefs from around the country about the state capitals. That's the kind of thing we were doing to try to make sure that we're doing the grind, the hard work to get in front of the threat. Uh, and we're going to keep working at it every single day. I, I understand your response. Uh, what I don't understand is why this chatter, raw intelligence, didn't prompt a stronger warning, an alarm, going to the very top of the United States Congress, because clearly the United States Congress was under severe threat. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.